start with a pulse check. Um, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected you and what have you learned from it? Well, <laughs> it's the first time in my life that um, I haven't traveled for 15 months, <laughs> which is very, very unusual. But I think the, the big thing about COVID-19, of course, I want to emphasize that the battle is not over, that we are still surrounded by the fog of war. Uh, it's dangerous to arrive at uh, long-term conclusions immediately. But nonetheless, it's very clear that uh, COVID-19 will be seen by future historians as one of those events that demonstrated how much the world has changed in the last 20, 30 years. How the West tends to lead the way in biotech and medical research and related issues. But when it comes to the handling of the pandemic, the East seems to be doing a, a, a better job, I would say. Um, so what's your view on this and, and how would you compare both parts of the world? Well, I, you know, I would say this is, this is one area where clearly uh, uh, COVID-19 has brought some major surprises to the world. Because when it, I think when it broke out, the, the general assumption uh, would have been that the more advanced societies, especially United States and Western Europe, would do better at managing COVID-19 and the uh, Asian societies, which are still overall far behind uh, United States and Europe, would have managed it badly, relatively speaking. So it's quite stunning that if you look at one of the indicators of performance, uh, the number of deaths per millions, uh, in most of East Asia, it's below 50 per million. And in the case of uh, United States and Europe, it's between 1,500 to 2,000 or larger. So the disparity is fundamental. And especially if you compare uh, United States uh, with uh, China, China with a population of uh, 1.4 billion, I think loss about five or 6,000 people to COVID-19 deaths and United States uh, lost 600,000. So if the United States had had the same rate of deaths per million as China, instead of having 600,000 deaths, United States would have had only 1,000 deaths. So you can imagine 599,000 lives could have been saved uh, if the United States had reacted as effectively as China, uh, China did. But having said that, I must say, while in the first phase, there's no doubt that the United States handled it badly, certainly in the last six months under Joe Biden, uh, the American performance has been much better. At the end of the day, the United States still demonstrated that it is a uh, scientific and technological powerhouse, and it was produced those vaccines as a result of what they call Operation Warp Speed. And now uh, life is going back uh, to normal in the United States faster than uh, most countries uh, in the world. So clearly, uh, they just while while you know, United States and East Asia overall still I think did a better job. The United States has bounced back significantly, especially under Joe Biden. How, how do you see the rise of geopolitics in a post-COVID-19 era? And especially, um, there's a lot of discussion recently um, about the supply chain security with the, US, with the US leading the debate on becoming less dependent on China. Uh, what's your take on that? And, and what's your observation? Well, you're right. By the way, uh, before I answer the geopolitical question, uh, the, the, the cultural differences are very clear. And you know, in the West, it's become very clear that the emphasis is on rights. Uh, and I think in Asia, there's an emphasis on responsibilities over rights. And that you should wear a mask, not just to protect yourself, but to protect your fellow citizens. And you have a responsibility to protect them. Whereas in the West, many people feel if they wear a mask, they're denying themselves freedom. But of course, they ignore that they have a responsibility to their fellow citizens. And, and one point I make is that 
when I was ambassador to the UN from uh, 1998 to 2004. In 1998, on the 50th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the, a former German chancellor, Helmut Schmidt, proposed that there be a Universal Declaration of Human Responsibilities to match a Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it's very sad that the Western countries pushed down the Universal Declaration of Human Responsibilities. But I think one lesson of COVID-19 is that we must push for greater acceptance of responsibilities. And so we should resuscitate the Universal Declaration of Human Responsibilities that was proposed by uh, former Chancellor Schmidt, together with other leaders, including Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, by the way, uh, of Singapore. Now, on the geopolitical question, it's important to emphasize that the US-China geopolitical contest uh, is being fueled by larger structural forces. And you know, I'm glad, thank you for putting my book behind your shoulder as I have my book behind my shoulder, uh, has China won. And so it's driven you know, by a 2000 year rule of geopolitics that the world's number one power always pushes down the world's number two power, which today is China. So US is pushing down China, that's normal. It's driven by the fear of the yellow peril, it's driven by a bipartisan consensus in the US that China has let the US down by failing to become democratic. You know, so these are the structural forces behind it. <coughs> COVID-19 added a new dimension to it. And certainly uh, when Donald Trump was president, he actually thought that, hey, when COVID-19 broke out in China, China would be in deep trouble. You know, China would suffer because it is not as advanced as, uh, United States. And so he was very laid back about the challenge. And that was, of course, a huge strategic mistake he made because actually overall, in the eyes of the, the, the rest of the world, and must emphasize there are about, let's say, 7.5, 7.6 billion people in the world and 1.6 billion live, or 1.7 billion live in uh, US and China. There are 6 billion people who live outside. And most of the 6 billion people who live outside have been very impressed at how well China has managed uh, the uh, COVID-19 issue. So China's standing actually has gone up in the, uh, uh, in the process uh, of the uh, COVID-19 episode. But the, the, uh, you, I think you also referred to the deglobalization, I believe. Yes. Uh, and how the US is trying to break up the supply yeah. chain of China, or maybe cut it out, and, yeah. and and that's also something that may actually lead to deglobalization yeah. instead of a globalization, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, opportunity for the world. Well, I think once again, I would say we are still, you know, haven't come out of COVID nineteen, so let's uh, be a bit cautious about passing final judgments. But I don't predict. You know, I know it is conventional wisdom in the West to say that there'll be deglobalization uh, after COVID-19. I have an opposite point of view. I actually predict uh, accelerated globalization after COVID-19. I mean, just ask yourself a very simple question. When COVID-19 is over, finally, and you can finally travel, what do you think most people in the world will want to do? They'll say, hey, I was locked up in my country for 15 to 16 months. Guess what? I can now finally go to the Antarctic. I can finally go to uh, the, North, uh, the Arctic. I can, you know, go and see uh, the, uh, um, you know, the Grand Canyon in Arizona. I can go and see the uh, springtime flowers in Japan. I'm going to go. And, and so you will see that travel uh, will, will come back with a real vengeance, you know? And, and, and so in that sense, that, that's one of the primary drivers of globalization. And in terms of trade, actually, uh, China will continue to grow its trade uh, with the rest of the world. And China today is the most confident country in the world when it comes to globalization. China believes it can compete with anybody. And so already you see that, you know, uh, China trades far more, in much more countries, more than the United States does, right? And so then the, United, the only danger of deglobalization is some kind of 
uh, detachment between the US and Chinese economies. I think there's a limit to how far it can go, but certainly the, U the US will become less reliant on China in many, many critical areas. So that, that might happen, but if there is greater uh, de detachment or delinking between the US and Chinese economies, the US might find that the US economy might become deglobalized, but the Chinese economy will become more globalized. And that actually is unwise for the United States uh, to do that. So I would say the United States should think very, very hard whether or not the trade war has benefited the United States. Actually, it hasn't. And when Joe Biden was a candidate, he himself said in the 2019 election campaign that the US-China trade war has not helped the American workers, has not helped the American consumers, has not helped the American farmers. So he should, he should basically stop it, but he cannot because the consensus in Washington DC is against China. So Biden's hands are tied. But while perhaps you can see globalization due to the opening up of the world and tourism's coming back. But then there's another rhetoric of, you know, one belt, one road. And just a few weeks ago, you know, Biden and the G7 countries talked about the Build Back Better World initiative. Um, then it comes back to geopolitics once again, even though um, uh, China, the US, they want to globalize uh, economy, but then it comes back down to all these initiatives and what's your observation on all these Belt and Road Initiative, the, the Build Back Better World Initiative? Mm. Well, I think, it, it, I think the word that uh, the uh, acronym that was used by the Biden administration uh, is B3W, uh, yes. Build Back Better World, B3W. And of course, you have the B3W and the BRI. And you know, one thing about our world is unbalanced because the Anglo-Saxon media dominates the global airway. So when the G7 meets, you know, every day you get these incredible photos of the G7 leaders and talking about them all the time. And I bet you almost none of your uh, listeners today noticed that just two nights ago on Wednesday night, China convened a BRI meeting uh, at which, uh, you know, I participated, I, I attended the meeting. And the uh, president of Colombia spoke there. The uh, foreign minister of Russia, Sergei Lavrov, spoke there. And almost all the ASEAN foreign ministers uh, spoke there, right? So it's interesting, you know, you, you get a lot of blanket coverage when the G7 meets, but the G7, you add it all up, comes to roughly uh, 700 million people or so, you know, like almost like less than 10% of the world's population, right? Whereas the countries that came and spoke at the BRI meeting were, were from Latin America, from Africa, from Southeast Asia, from the Pacific, you know, the Prime Minister of Fiji spoke there. Uh, so you didn't notice it. And, that, and therefore, you get, if, you, if you follow the Anglo-Saxon media, you get a very distorted view uh, of the world because most countries in the world have now focus on jump-starting or restarting their economies. And they're more likely to be able to do so by trading with China than they are through, through trading with the um, United States because China is now willing to sign more and more uh, free trade agreements with countries and the United States cannot do so. So at the end of the day, it, most countries want to focus on their economic growth and development. And, and, and China has, a, is, to, the important figure here, China has set aside $1.7 trillion for the Belt and Road Initiative. I bet you the B3W doesn't have anything like that kind of money at all. <laughs> They'd be lucky if they get $100 billion for the B3W. But, um, but I guess also at the G7 meeting, besides um, the talks of the, the, um, all the initiatives, um, there's also the rhetoric of democracy versus autocracy. And Biden kind of tried to rally the other Western world to Com combat against autocracy. And I think um, in your book, Has China Won, or even in your recent interview, 
you talk about how America has a very simplistic view, and mm. and it's a it's it's a very unipolar uh, thinking versus how the world has shifted to be more multipolar. Uh, mm. Would you mind commenting on that? And mm. well, I think that that has now become one of the biggest uh, obstacle uh, uh, reasons for misunderstanding between uh, especially China and the US and China and the West, because the, both the United States with the support of many Anglo-Saxon countries has a very sort of black and white view of the world, you know? I mean, if you're a democracy, you're white. And if you're not, not white in the racist sense, but if <laughs> just white in the sense of good, uh, and uh, black, and if you are a, if you don't have a democracy like China, you are black, you know. And I think that fails to capture the nature of the Chinese political system, because the Chinese political system uh, is strong. In fact, it's one of the strongest and most durable political systems in the world today, because it is not suppressing the Chinese people. It is actually lifting up the standards of living uh, of the Chinese people. And in, even, as I say, a Harvard Kennedy School uh, study by the Ash Center for Governance has shown how support for the Chinese government has gone up from uh, 86% in 2003 to 93% in 2016. And if you tell, if you tell the Americans or indeed some other Anglo-Saxon countries you know what, the Chinese people are actually very happy with their government. They cannot believe you. They say they don't have them, they don't have democracy. How can they be happy? And 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 but the paradox here, and this and this is probably the most important point that my book makes as China won, that if you see this as a contest between democracy in the United States and of course uh, authoritarian system or autocracy in China then clearly the Americans can relax because democracies traditionally, traditionally perform better than autocracies. But if you deep, deep down, functionally, the United States is, is really not really a democracy. It's become a plutocracy. So instead of a government of the 100%, by the 100%, for the 100%, it has functionally become a government of the 1%, by the 1%, for the 1% and explains why the standard of living of the bottom 50% has gone down over a 30 year period. And the case of China, instead of an autocracy, China has actually become a meritocracy where you have a government that selects among the best and brightest to serve in the Chinese government. And that explains why the Chinese government has performed very well in many areas. So for example, the, uh, the reason why the United States handled, uh, why China handled COVID-19 so well is because its health system is far superior uh, in managing uh, challenges like this. And, and if you look at China's space program, I mean, that space program takes a tremendous amount of scientific ingenuity. And if people are being suppressed and oppressed, how do you get this kind of creative minds that China has? Uh, today. So that's why it's a huge mistake uh, for the United States to, to sort of make it a black and white issue between the uh, democracies being good and autocracies being bad, because the governments around the world uh, are different shades of gray. There are no black and white in distinction, no black and white distinction. So the United States clearly is a strong society. And indeed, in my book, I emphasize that China should never underestimate the United States. It is still by far the most successful society since human history began. So United States has got great strengths, but China is showing China also has great strengths. And it is not true that the democracies are naturally better off than a system like China. So uh, there is this frequently asked questions. How should countries take side in this US-China tension? And there are four places in particular that are most interested in your view. The first one is uh, India, uh, in which I think in your previous interviews, as well as in your book, um, I think there's a debate of how the US wishes to have India to counterbalance China. Then the second uh, country that I would like to get your view is Japan. Obviously, I think uh, Japan 
does an uh, equal amount of trade with US and China. And obviously the third one is your hometown, Singapore. Mm -hmm. And finally, my hometown, Hong Kong. So mm -hmm. how would you comment on these four places and as well as how all these places have to take sides or maybe they don't have to take sides at all? Well, I think there's no question whatsoever. This is a point that I make uh, in my book, Has China Won? That the, you know, the six billion people who live outside the US and China, the vast majority of them want to focus on their own economic development and growth. And they really don't want to take uh, sides in this contest. So there's no, unlike the Cold War, where many countries uh, like the European countries uh, enthusiastically supported the United States against the Soviet Union and even third world countries like Indonesia, Pakistan, Egypt, uh, Brazil supported the United States against the Soviet Union. Today, it, most of these countries in the world are doing more trade with China than they are with the US, as I pointed out earlier. And so uh, as a result of that, clearly, the, the, there'll be a reluctance to choose sides. But you're right to emphasize two key countries, namely Japan and, and, and China and uh, India. But they have very different considerations here. Uh, Japan, of course, is a traditional ally uh, of the United States. So there's no question whatsoever that Japan will stick with the United States. And, and it's also good for the world that Japan remains a US ally because if Japan is no longer a US ally, and if Japan has to protect itself from China, then Japan will have to become an independent nuclear power. And is we, the world doesn't need a new nuclear power to emerge. So it's actually in China's interest to see Japan remain as an ally of the United States because that prevents the nuclearization of Japan. Now, India, of course, is a very different uh, uh, country and traditionally, India has always tried to have an independent, non-aligned uh, policy. But of late, you are right, uh, partly because of the tragic accident that happened exactly a year ago in June 2020, where Indian and Chinese soldiers died at the border. There has been a strong wave of anti-China sentiment in India. And so in some ways, India appears to be leaning uh, towards the, the United States. But at the same time, uh, India has also emphasized that it is keeping up its links uh, with China and uh, it is certainly keeping up its um, uh, links with Russia. It's a member of BRICS, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. So I think, you know, the story of India is, is complicated, uh, but it will... Um, it, it will lean towards the US, but I don't think it will become a United States ally uh, against uh, China. Uh, Hong, in the case of Hong Kong, as you know, Hong Kong is part of China already. It's part of the sovereign territory of China. And actually it's best for uh, a sovereign territory of China uh, not to in any way stuck, stick his neck out and get involved in this uh, US-China contest. Uh, and similarly, I think in the case of Singapore, Singapore's position is similar to that of the 10 ASEAN countries. Uh, we want to have good relations with the United States. We want to have good relations with China. And, and I think most of the ASEAN countries are going to do that because right you now, if you look at the ASEAN countries, the, the most important thing to look at is the statistics on trade. In the year 2000, uh, United States trade with ASEAN countries, 10 ASEAN countries, was $130 billion, and China was only $40 billion. So US trade with ASEAN was three times Chinese trade with ASEAN. You, but you fast forward to 2020, US trade had grown four times from $130 billion to roughly $500 billion. But Chinese trade with ASEAN had grown 25 times from $40 billion to $1 trillion. So double that of the United States. So you can't expect the ASEAN countries to give up their trading links uh, with China. And you know, the Southeast Asia has lived next door to China for 2,000 years. So it's not going to <laughs> uh, get involved in an anti-China campaign or an anti-China crusade. So it's very, very unrealistic of the Americans to expect this. And in fact, what, what we the best, the better thing for uh, uh, 
United States to do is actually try and work with ASEAN countries to see whether or not you can create a cooperative partnerships in this region. Right. Now, let's have a question that brings us back to even closer to Singapore and Hong Kong. Now, obviously, um, Hong Kong and Singapore have coexisted as great friends for decades. But the media somehow likes to paint Hong Kong's challenges as Singapore's opportunities. Um, you know, we know that together, we have thrived together, and we have different roles in the region. But looking into Hong Kong as a Singaporean and a diplomat yourself, can you share your views of the future of Hong Kong and how either Hong Kong and China's relationship, as well as how Singapore maybe could facilitate and, and mm. play part in this uh, friendship altogether? Well, I, I want to declare my bias, okay? I love Hong Kong. <laughs> Indeed, it's been very painful that I have not been able to go to Hong Kong for now 18 months or so, which is unusual. I would normally visit Hong Kong at least two, three times a year because I have so many friends in Hong Kong. And to be honest with you, I love the food in Hong Kong. <laughs> so, Thank you. So I, I, as soon as the travel, I was hoping the travel bubble would open up and I was going to go and see my friends in Hong Kong as soon as the travel bubble opened but that travel bubble, unfortunately, hasn't happened yet. So as soon as I can travel to Hong Kong, I'm coming to uh, Hong Kong. And I completely share your view. And I think this is the Singapore government's view too. The Singapore government believes that it is good to have two strong, thriving financial centers, uh, Hong Kong and Singapore. And actually, it's the competition between Hong Kong and Singapore has helped Hong Kong and helped Singapore. And I, and I think it's against Singapore's interest to see in any way the collapse or, or disappearance of Hong Kong as a major uh, financial center or major trading hub or major investment hub and, and so on and so forth. So actually it is in Singapore's national interest to see Hong Kong thrive uh, uh, and, and, and do well because that's good for the whole region because at the end of the day, the growth of Singapore and the growth of ASEAN will be tied uh, to what happens in East Asia. And, and here, uh, as you know, the, one of the most uh, wonderful things that happened in 2020 in, a, in what was otherwise a bad year for human history was that the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership was uh, uh, signed and created in 2020. And this was a project initiated by the 10 ASEAN countries and it also involved China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, 10 plus five. And, and this trade agreement is what you call an indicator of the future we're gonna have because there'll be a tremendous growth of trade between uh, the whole entire East Asian region. And I think Hong Kong will benefit from this explosion of trade. And so will we'll, 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 we'll sing, so we'll Singapore. And I think the more that Hong Kong and Singapore cooperate in the next 10 to 20 years, the better off Hong Kong will be, the better off Singapore will be. We have a lot of investors here. And as you mentioned about a lot of trades will open up and so forth. Is there any particular sector or industry that is of your interest or that Hong Kong and Singapore could coordinate and collaborate and drive further to benefit the entire Asia? Any particular sector of your interest or topic of interest? Well, I mean, you, 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 you mentioned that I'm uh, chairman of the NUS uh, School of Medicine International Council, and it's a great honor to be made chairman uh, of that council. I think one, one, one thing that um, COVID-19 has shown is the importance of obviously medical research. And, and, and I think Hong Kong has got uh, very good schools of medicine, I know. And Singapore, of course, has got excellent schools of medicine to several. And co collaboration uh, in that sphere would, I think, be a very positive uh, development. And the advantage we have is that, uh, it's funny, a medicine in theory should be neither Eastern nor Western. I mean, medical science is universal, right? But yet, as you know, uh, there is uh, growing misunderstanding within the US and China in many areas 
uh, all kinds of allegations are being made on the origins of uh, COVID-19. And frankly, these are scientific questions that politicians shouldn't get involved in at all. So if we can help to, in a sense, help uh, Western scientists come to uh, East Asia and work closely with East Asian scientists, including Chinese scientists, then I think that's an area of, of, of collaboration that would be good uh, for Hong Kong, for Singapore, uh, and, 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 and for the world too. And I know that recently, um, the National University of Singapore has named a professorship after you. And I think it's called the Kishore Mabubani Professorship in Medicine and Health Policy. And I guess similar to your vision, I guess the goal is to promote innovation, build knowledge, inspire young minds and students and so forth. But within the field of say medicine and health policy, uh, what else are we lacking here in the region compared to the West? Is it more of a research uh, as we mentioned earlier or is it just public policy that is lacking in, in general? Or, or is there an initiative where we could help um, our neighbors in building a stronger infrastructure? What kind of change would you like to see as you steer into that professorship and research? Well, I mean, the, uh, by the way, thank you very much for mentioning uh, the Kishan Mahubani professorship in uh, medicine and health policy. Uh, as you know, we're still trying to raise the funding <laughs> for the chair. Uh, the, and, and the reason why the chair is timely and the reason why I supported this chair uh, is that, you know, the big lesson of COVID-19 uh, is that if you want to succeed in defeating a virus, you obviously have to have strong uh, institutions of medicine, so medical research and so on and so forth. But you also need to have good public policies in health also. And the reason why China did much better in managing COVID-19 than say the United States did, is that in the field of medicine, China is still ahead of, of China, no question whatsoever. It's, it's scientists, it's scientific research and all that is way ahead of China. But when it comes to health policy, uh, sadly, uh, United States is far behind uh, uh, China and indeed, frankly, far behind the rest of the world. So for example, if you compare the, and, and some, some American professors have done this, uh, uh, compare uh, America's track record with uh, Singapore's track record in, in, in public policies in health. And United States spends as a percentage of GNP four times as much as Singapore does. And the outcomes in terms of life expectancy, infant mortality, and all the other leading indicators of health and well being, United States is behind Singapore. So, and th that shows you the importance of good uh, public policies uh, in health. And, 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 and therefore, the establishment of such a chair, I think, can make a big difference uh, uh, to, to, in a sense, having the web, helping the world also understand why is it that East Asia has done relatively well uh, in managing COVID-19. In a, in, in a previous interview of yours, I, you, you tried to answer the question of how uh, Western countries try to accuse China for creating or coming up with the virus. And you kind of mentioned about the Lehman crisis in the US and, and as a philosopher, how would you look at that accusation? Uh, obviously we have a lot of investors here. It would be good if you could compare that and share your views mm. and, and maybe answer that mm. again. Yes, uh, well, I mean, as you know, um, President Trump, who I think, by the way, we must never write off President Trump. Huh? Uh, I, as, as Martin Wolf of the Financial Times has said, that the Biden administration may turn out to be a pleasant interlude between two Trump administrations. And in the year 2024, if for example, uh, President Joe Biden decides not to run again, and if the contest is between Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, I would say President Trump's chances of winning are quite high because he got 75 million votes. 
uh, from uh, in the year 2020. And of course, Donald Trump has realized that one way of getting votes in, uh, uh, in the US is to beat up on China because there's a very strong anti-China sentiment in the American body politic. If I'm not mistaken, he's also said that China owes the world $10 trillion for the damage it has done with uh, COVID-19. And, and if I, but once you want to accept the principle that countries that create global crisis are responsible for compensating the rest of the world, then the United States will have to make a massive compensation to the world because the global financial crisis uh, of 2008, 2009 was actually created by the Lehman Brothers uh, collapse. And so the, it was the United States mismanagement uh, of that crisis that created a, a global financial crisis, which actually in many ways was more devastating in economic terms than COVID-19 has been. So I'm actually quite surprised how many countries are recovering so fast from uh, the COVID-19 economic downturn. And the 2008, 2009 was much worse. And so it is therefore not in the interest of the United States to say that uh, if you create a global crisis, you're responsible. And in, in, in any case, uh, there is, it's, you cannot possibly believe that China intentionally started COVID-19. You, you must have your head examined if you believe that, because China also uh, suffered from uh, uh, COVID-19, just as clearly it was not in the intention of the United States to create a global crisis by mismanaging uh, Lehman Brothers' crisis. So the accidents do happen. And actually the lesson from these accidents is that when such a major crisis breaks out, the worst thing you can do is to play the blame game. You should actually be collaborating. And one of the other key, another key points I make, Ronald, in my writings is that before the era of globalization, when 7.5 billion people lived in 193 separate countries, it was as though they were living in 193 separate boats, right? each country was a boat of its own. And so if one boat caught COVID-19, the other boat wouldn't get it because in a different boat, COVID-19 cannot fly across the sea, right? But what globalization has done is to shrunk the world when the 7.5 billion people no longer live in 193 separate boats. They live in 193 separate cabins on the same boat. And so clearly all 7.5 billion of us, if we are on the same boat, and if the boat catches fire, which is what COVID-19 was, the stupidest thing you can do is to start arguing about who started the fire. You should immediately cooperate to put out the fire first. And, and, and the tragedy of 2020, and this is why, in a sense, it was timely that my book has China One came on 2020, is that the, normally when you have a crisis like that, all the passengers in the boat, on our common global boat, should have come together to cooperate and, and kill COVID-19 first before carrying on with the contest. But the fact that the United States and China carried on with the contest instead of cooperating confirmed the thesis of my book that a major geopolitical contest has broke up between US and China. By the end of the day, I still keep on appealing to both countries to say, set aside your geopolitical differences, focus on taking care of the world first. Uh, you've been a diplomat for 15 years, maybe more than that by now. And how do you see the world 15 years from now? How would you envision it? Well, I mean, I, I've been writing about the return of Asia since my first book, Can Asians Think, came out in 1998. But the essays were written in 1990. So I've been writing about the return of Asia for 30 years. And in the year 2050, uh, I'll be 102 then, by the way. <laughs> Uh, if I'm alive, I think the world will be so different from the world of today. And it's very sad that some of the leading Western minds who are so stuck in this artificial era, artificial era of Western domination of world history over the last 200 years, they're not mentally preparing their minds for a world which is no longer dominated. Uh, by the West. Clearly, United States will be the number two economy in the world. 
And actually, in purchasing power parity terms, some people have predicted that number one will be China, number two will be India, number three will be United States of America. The Americans psychologically can't even, you know, if you are an American politician today in the United States and you decide to speak the truth and you say, hey, we in the United States must now prepare for the day when we're going to become the number two economy in the world, you, you, it's like committing suicide, political suicide. And that's the tragedy about the United States of America. It's a land of free speech. They say you can say anything you want, but if a politician speaks the truth and says the United States must prepare to become number two, he's politically dead. And so as a, one, one of the goals of my writings is, is to, try, to try to help my friends in the West understand that the 21st century will be the Asian century. The center of gravity of the world's economy will be in East Asia, standing above Hong Kong and Singapore. And, and so you've got to adjust to a very different world and you've got to learn basically, and this is a hard thing to say, to be more modest and more humble and less judgmental uh, about Asians. Because one thing I noticed among my Asian friends, especially after COVID-19, they're, they're getting very, very tired of being lectured to by Westerners, very tired. And they're saying enough is enough. Uh, we don't, we, why don't you take care of your own affairs first? Take care, of, look at how you handle COVID-19. Look after yourself first before you pass judgment. So a world that is coming, which the, which the Western countries dread, is actually a better world because it will be multipolar, multi-civilizational and multilateral, three M's. And this multi-civilizational, multipolar, multilateral world can actually be a happier world for the West and for the East. But psychologically, the West must change its mind. And that's what I'm trying to do in my writing. Well, Professor, I think you're a beacon of clarity in a very noisy political world. And I hope your assessment is right about the world. And I know we are coming to a close and I will tell, share with the audience that if they are interested in the geopolitics of Asia, as well as in the world, I would recommend all my audience here to read Has China Won? And for those who are interested in the book, I'm happy to send you a copy and maybe we can ask Professor for an autograph. And to participate and to help the world, I would also recommend the audience here uh, to think about and to even search about um, the Kishore Mabubani Professorship of Medicine and Health Policy. And for those who are interested, feel free to let me know and I will share with you as well. And in the meantime, thank you so much, Professor, for joining us today. And I hope I can welcome you again in the near future. And when you do get to travel again, I would love to invite you to Hong Kong and I will book all the best foods for you here. So stay tuned, come over, and we'll welcome you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.